All right, here we are today. We're all the way up at chapter 13, and things are just starting to get real psychologically funky, all right? So, <clears throat> we're going to start to meet some uh, interesting characters in this chapter. As a reminder, we're going to talk about, uh, uh, what is this, uh, reaction paper 7. So, remind me to come back and talk about it at the end, all right? <laughs> Well, I want to talk a little bit about, remember we had, we had said that there was some real blowback in psychology, in particular people like John Watson, who had some real problems with structuralism, and he said, look, um, structuralism sucks uh, because what, what you're doing is you're trying to break down the mental life, you're using uh, uh, the, your, your dependent variables, your uh, your measurements, your measurements, your your introspection. It's not science, not science, man. If you can't, if it's not publicly observable, then it's not science, you know? So they said, no. Well, meanwhile, they were having a similar kind of argument going on over in physics, okay? And so there's, you know, the, basically the argument was, if you can't measure it, you can't study it, right? But if you're a physicist and you want to study gravity, you're screwed, right? Because, I mean, you can't give me a hand full of gravity. You can't do it. So Percy Bridgman solved this problem with something called an operational definition. And an operational definition is a definition of a hypothetical construct. Because that's what gravity is, a hypothetical construct. And as a hint, guess what? All kinds of psychology things are hypothetical constructs, you know, like intelligence and cognition and all of these internal processes that we can't even see. So here's what Percy Bridgman said. If you have a hypothetical construct, as long as you operationally define it, then you can study it because scientists can agree upon what you're talking about. Okay. And so we're back to the wrong slide. There we go. So neo-behaviorism agreed with the other earlier forms of behaviorism and uh, that really only overt behavior should be the subject of study. But what happened was they felt that um, as long as you're doing it properly, you could study these internal processes as long as you study... Again, these operational definitions in the realm of psychology, these operational definitions will be in terms of external measurable behaviors. And so we could study all of a sudden intelligence, a hypothetical construct that has no 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 meat to it. But if you, you define intelligence, I mean here's a bad operational definition, but if intelligence is defined operationally defined as the score you receive on an intelligence test all of a sudden, the score is an externally measurable behavior. It is publicly observable. It is repeatable. It is good science data. And as long as all researchers agree that the operational definition of intelligence is the score you receive on an intelligence test, you can have a educated conversation about a hypothetical construct. Okay, And so one of the earliest neo-behaviorists, one of the first to break ranks with, with rigid behaviorism was um, Edward Tolman. And he, he proposed this thing called intervening variables, which are very similar to hypothetical constructs. But these are the events that occur between the environment and behavioral events. In other words, intervening variables are sort of like, um, I mean, we've, 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 I think I used this example previously, but the, the example, um, the doorbell rings, stimulus in the environment, my dog wagged its tail, physically external measurable response. And we go, the dog is happy. So the idea is an intervening variable is the thing that comes between stimulus and response. Or in, in research terms, it's the thing that comes in between independent variable and dependent variable and explain why the cause and effect relationship really happens. The real reason doorbell, dog wag tail is because dog happy. Okay, so intervening variables are sort of like the thing that gets in between intervene, uh, independent and dependent and truly explains the relationship. And so he did some very interesting work here with mazes. Okay, so here we got a rat and a tea maze. Okay, and when you put the rat in the tea maze, number one, the rats just, you know, random stuff happens. So you put them in there a couple of times, and then when you put the rat in, according to Tolman, here's what happens stimulus. Maze, a presence of maze. Response, start walking. But what comes in between there is this, an intervening variable. He says, when the rat is put into the maze at the beginning, it generates a hypothesis 
I expect that somewhere at the end of this maze there will be cheese. And it is this, this hypothesis that the rat has that leads to. And he had quite a large set of, um, of uh, stages through which the rat would go. But there was a series of intervening variables, including things like ex expectation. You know, you put the rat, after going through this 50 trials, the rat has an expectation that when I get put into this maze, then... I can proceed through it and get to the end. And at some point, if you keep the rat in long enough, if you put the rat in enough times, that what's going to happen is the rat's going to develop what, what Tolman referred to as a cognitive map. And it goes like this. An intervening variable. So, presence of you know, stimulus, presence of maze. Intervening variable, a cognitive map, which is a mental representation of the maze and all of the consequences of behaviors. So, when you put the rat in the maze, stimulus, a cognitive map arises in the, ma the rat's brain, and that leads to the response of running the maze correctly and getting to the end. Okay? So, a cognitive map is a kind of a, it's, it's really quite far out there for a behaviorist, but he still is a behaviorist. Well, Tolman did a very interesting, this is um, particularly interesting, it's, it's less interesting in the history of psychology sense, but it's very interesting in the field of learning, okay? So here we've got a graph, and uh, let me describe the blue line first, okay? The, the blue line here, you see it's a steady decrease, and what happens is you put a rat in a maze, and this is traditional rats, you put the rat in the maze, and at the end, there's some cheese or something. And on day one, the rat makes, uh, what, 28 errors. I'm looking at the blue line. So on day one, 28 errors. Lovely. On day two, you put the rat in the maze, it makes 24 errors. On the third day, you put the rat in, and it makes an average of 25 errors. And, okay? and it goes on and proceeds to get better and better. And this is a traditional learning curve, right? The way it's going down like that. Traditional learning curve. Okay? No problem. Now, the green group there is very similar except there's no cheese at the end okay when the rats get to the end of the maze they just get taken out of the maze all right and so here's what happens is i mean you see a little decrease in performance at first um they make 28 errors and then they make and then but notice that they leveled off there around 20 errors so every day you put them in the maze and they just sort of randomly go around Okay. According to many of the behaviors before them, this was an indication that the rat had not learned anything. And Thomas said, no, 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 no. The rat has developed that cognitive map. You do not need the rat to actually physically perform the behavior for the cognitive map to develop. Because when you put the rat in the maze, it triggers the cognitive map. However, you're in a situation where the rat is not motivated. Okay. So, he puts together a final group, this orange line, okay? And the rats in the, 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 the orange line group, they, uh, they're put in the maze, and there's no cheese at the end. And so, they just, they look fairly well like that green group, see the green line group. Then, somewhere around day 10, he puts cheese in the end. And so, the rats, they're just walking through the maze, doing random shit, and then one day, holy balls, there's cheese! And guess what happens on day 11 and day 12? The rat instantly shows that he knows how. And Tolman said, it's not like the rat learned on trial 11 or day 11. It's not like the rat learned. The rat already knew way back when all about that maze. He developed a cognitive map. He understood everything. But here's what Coleman said. Learning plus motivation equals performance. All right? You have to have both or you won't get nothing. Another one of the odd little <clears throat> behaviorists, neo-behaviorists, was Clark Hall. And I'm going to give you just a, a smattering. I had to memorize, oh my goodness, in my uh, undergraduate learning class, the professor had some kind of love affair with Hall or something, because uh, he made us memorize Hall's entire equation. And it was like 30, 30 variables long. But here's essentially, it's it's very, very similar to what Tolman just said in the last cognitive map stuff. He said, um, this variable SER, which is um, reaction potential, or uh, whether or not an animal will behave given a certain situation. And he said, 
This is a combination of habit strength. And habit strength is sort of like, again, it's an intervening variable. You notice the S on the left side and the R on the other. So it's something that gets in between stimulus and response. And habit strength is uh, sort of like strength of learning, strength of conditioning or something like that. But you have to take that learning times D, which is drive, which is really just a fancy word for motivation. And so the potential of an animal to exhibit behavior in a given situation is a the result of the habit strength, or how much they've learned, times drive, which is, of course, motivation, okay? Now, his equation just went out and out and out, and I mean, here you can see a small, it went much further than this, but you can see that ESR, that uh, reaction potential, or will an animal exhibit the behavior, is a function of habit strength times drive. I even forget what K was. I, I don't even remember, and V, I, 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 I think V was the... Uh, the size of the reward or something like that. I don't even remember. And then subtracting some other, um, some uh, inhibitory effects, like uh, on some some trials, maybe you didn't give the, f the rat food at the end or something like that. And then at the end, he puts an o uh, oscillation factor, which is basically a, uh, uh, you don't really know. But it's kind of a neat idea, because what he was attempting to do was predict behavior perfectly. He truly believed just like some of the earlier earlier uh, empiricists, that uh, you can predict behavior 100%. I mean, it's a matter of not necessarily knowing all the enough information to get it predicted perfectly. But he said, look, I can create this equation, and in this equation, I can predict completely. It was just an amazingly cool idea that you could predict whether or not an animal would exhibit a behavior in a given situation based on all of these inputs. And it was actually pretty good. I mean, he was pretty good at predicting, but like I said, that little um, oscillation factor at the end was sort of like just a fudge factor, right? <laughs> like... Well, I know I don't get it perfect, so I'll just throw on the oscillation factor for shit happens. <laughs> yeah, the shit happens factor. All right. And so, Edwin Guthrie had himself a little bit of oddball thinking about neo-behaviorism. And he proposed something called one trial learning. Okay. He said, look, you know, everybody going back, we're talking about um, Thorndike. I mean... Everybody, everybody's been talking about um, how learning gradually occurs. Heck, you even saw the picture with um, just just a minute ago with uh, Pullman's experiment there, where where the curve gradually came down. So learning occurs gradually, or something. No, Guthrie said, nope, 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 nope. Learning occurs in an instant, one instant. Okay. He says a stimulus pattern gains its full associative strength on the occasion of its pairing with a response. So. What happens is, say, for example, the very first time a kid ever saw the salt shaker and the pepper shaker next to each other, they learn salt-pepper association, just like that, one shot. But what happens is a kid learned a very, 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 very specific salt shaker associated with a very, very, very specific pepper shaker. And each time the kids saw salt and pepper together, they were slightly different pepper shakers and salt shakers, and so progressively the, the, the child is learning or the child appears as though they're learning the connection between salt and pepper gradually, but the fact is, no, 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 all learning occurs on one trial, but what is learned is very, very specific, okay? And so, here's what uh, he did here. He took this and he said, okay, movements are the things that are learned in one shot, okay? That is to say, a rat learns about one movement in a maze, or... um. The, the, how about golf? Golf is a, a good one. Golf, in fact, I'll take it backwards. Golf is a skill, okay? Golf is a skill, and it has many acts. Of course, the acts of golfing are um, putting and chipping and wedging and driving. I don't know if wedging is a word, but whatever, okay? Wedging and driving and all of these different things, okay? And each act, let's just pick one, putting, is composed of thousands, no, millions of movements. And here's what Guthrie argues. Every single time you putt, you are learning a specific movement. An exact, when the ball is here, ling, ding, ding, and the wind, ding, ding, perfect. But the problem is the act of putting 
can consist of thousands and thousands and millions of movements and the skill of golf is composed of many acts put together okay but the actual associations are formed on one trial they don't gradually gain strength they are on or off okay so skinner um well i don't want to say that one but skinner was a little bit odd he was a very he was he was a flashback. He kind of got rid of the neo-behaviorism part, and he really refused to study anything to do with internal mental processes. Now, Skinner was a major player in the history of psychology, and I, I gotta, I gotta throw my pedigree out there just in case you guys are all wondering about my <clears throat> whether I'm a mutt or a purebred. And the answer is I'm a purebred, buddy, because we find that B.F. Skinner taught uh, a guy named uh, Hernstein up at Harvard. And Hernstein took his degree at Harvard and stayed at Harvard, and he taught a guy named Racklin at Harvard. And uh, Racklin left Harvard, went to the New School, and then went out to uh, Stony Brook and taught me. So I am a one, two, three, third generation Skinnerian. Four? Three? I'm going to say three. I don't know. Whatever that is. Okay. So, wait, wait, now, second, third, hell, I'm a fourth. Okay, a fourth generation Skinnerian, which is, which is a pretty good pedigree to have, I mean, in, in a direct ascension here, okay? So, anyway, here's what Skinner said, was that um, he did not want to study um, the, what was it? The respondent behavior was a behavior that had been uh, the stuff of interest to people such as Pavlov and classical conditioning. It's behavior that is elicited by a known stimulus. That is to say, a behavior, in fact, respondent behavior would be, um, I hit your knee with a rubber mallet and your knee goes up. That's respondent behavior. It's behavior that is elicited by a known stimulus in the environment. Okay? And so, this was referred to as SR psychology, which is uh, environmental stimuli elicit almost all behaviors. Okay? Clearly, that was Watson and, and the Russians. But what happened is B.F. Skinner was more interested in what he referred to as instrumental conditioning. See, he said, look, it's not that, um, it's not necessarily that the environment elicits behavior so much as the environment is instrumental in selecting responses, okay? And it's really quite an interesting thing. It all came, came down to um, uh, Thorndike's Law of Effect. And Thorndike's Law of Effect, uh, do I have this up in here? Yeah, here's basically Thorndike's law of effect. This is a little bit, uh, a little bit different, but here's Thorndike's law of effect. If an operant response leads to reinforcement, the rate of that response will increase. Basically, the actual law of effect reads this: It says, if a behavior is followed by a satisfying state of affairs, then the probability that that behavior will be repeated in the future goes up. And if a behavior is followed by a dissatisfying state of affairs, then the probability that that behavior will be repeated in the future goes down. As it's a whole lot of words that basically says uh, behaviors are controlled by their consequences. The behaviors we exhibit are a function of the consequences of them. The behaviors we exhibit are not in direct response, not in the reflexive manner. Okay? Hit your, hit your knee with a hammer and your knee goes up. Okay? Not in this purely reflexive manner. And so the environment selects, or the reinforcement contingencies more specifically select. Okay? And so now we get into this stuff that's up in your uh, your paper, okay? Paper, so reaction paper. And so here, here's what he talked about. He talked about, as I said, the consequences of behavior. So if a behavior is followed by something good, and there's two different types of something good, okay? Positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. Positive reinforcement is what you would typically think of as reinforcement. That is to say... A child does something good and you praise the child. Okay, you say, oh, good job, son. That, that's excellent. Negative reinforcement is one where um, you perform a behavior and something you don't like goes away. In both of these cases, if something you do like is given to you or if something you do not like is taken away, both of these consequences, outcomes, will lead to an increase in the behavior that came before it. In fact, one of my favorite uh, jokes, when I was in second grade, I, I got a little joke out. Uh, I guess I, it's my seventh birthday, yeah. And uh, this little album, you know, record album. And I, I had a little uh, little blue record player, very cute. And uh, I played the hell out of that thing until it died. And this joke album, my favorite joke on that album, I can still remember this. And it went like this. It said, there's this guy, you know, two guys talking. And this guy goes, 
oh, my feet hurt. And the other guy's, why? He goes, oh, my favorite shoes. And the guy says, what? What do you mean your favorite shoes? But your feet hurt. He says, yeah, but my shoe, you know, my favorite shoes are five sizes too small. And the guy's like, why would you wear shoes that are five sizes too small? And he says, because they feel so good when I take them off. Right. And that's negative reinforcement, right? That because it feels so good when you take them off, it increases the behavior that came before it, which is literally putting on shoes that don't fit. <laughs> that's silly. Um, at the same time, the law of effect also said if a behavior is followed by something, uh, well, uh, technically it said if a behavior is followed by a dissatisfying state of affairs, then the probability that that behavior will be repeated in the future goes down. In other words, if you perform a behavior and the consequences of it are such that you do not like it, and so there are two things that can happen. We can either have positive punishment, which is to say, add something you don't like, like a spanking, or negative punishment take away something the kid does like, or kid, I mean, anybody does like, and so we could revoke a driver's license or something like that. Either way, add something good or take, or no, add something bad or take away something good, either way, you're going to decrease the behavior that came before it, okay? Okay. You know, yeah. So, as we said, Watson and the other Russian physiologists felt that the environment was important because it elicited behavior, but Skinner said, yeah, okay, the environment's important, but it, it doesn't elicit behavior in some reflexive manner. It selects behavior, okay? It selects which behavior an organism will produce, okay? Because, of course, the organism has the ability to produce many, many behaviors, and it selects it. Reinforcement strengthens behavior. Punishment does not weaken behavior. According to, to Skinner, he said um, punishment is often used because, of course, it reinforces the person giving the punishment. And anybody who's a frustrated parent can tell you that uh, when your kid goes off, man, you want to smack that ass. And it's not even necessarily because you want to correct behavior, but because you are so... Oh, All right. Not me, though. I would never smack my kids, right? No, I'll leave that to somebody else. Um, and so, according to him, punishment was a bad thing. It creates fear, aggression, and other negative behaviors. Um, he says if you just ignore undesirable stuff, it goes away. Okay? So, he thinks you should reinforce the behaviors that are positive and ignore the ones that you don't want, and it'll disappear on its own. And so, the outcome of some of these Skinnerian principles included behavioral therapy. Again, we, we had talked about some of the behavioral therapy of John Watson, and it's similar, but the, the behavioral therapy that uh, came directly out of Skinner's work were token economies, which is uh, basically reinforcement contingencies that are used in many institutional settings to um, increase the probability of certain behaviors. Like, say, for example, um, increase the probability of... Um, making their bed. So every time a person in an institution makes their bed, you give them a token. The tokens can then be traded, of course, for something positive later. And so, yeah, and so we could move toward, yeah, I'll leave it alone. Okay, I'm going to come back to the uh, reaction paper here before we run out of time. We're already out of time. I'm gonna go. The law of effect states that if a behavior is followed by a satisfying state of affairs, the probability of that behavior reoccurring in the future rises. And if a behavior is followed by an annoying state of affairs, I thought it was dissatisfying. Good enough. An annoying state of affairs, the probability of that behavior reoccurring in the future decreases. So, question one, pretty straightforward. Is punishment effective way, an effective way to eliminate bad behavior? Um, well, it's up to you. I mean, like we said, Skinner said punishment is not effective. But I can tell you something right now that... Uh, you get yourself a, a kid who's nine months old and just crawling on the floor and they start putting their finger over to the electrical socket and you smack that hand, you're going to get a kid that's crying his ass off and a kid will never put her hand back into that electric socket. Did the kid's behavior change? Yes. Was it the most effective way? Well, the kid's nine years old and I don't really have the ability to, to rationalize and reason with him. So, bang, sorry, got the job done. My opinion. What's the virtues of using positive and negative punishment? Yeah, positive punishment has gotten a bad rap in recent years. Hell, it's it's called child abuse nowadays. If you give positive punishment to your kids in public, all right? Negative punishment is now the new politically correct way to punish your child. You know, take away things they desire. All right. 
Now, here's an opinion. Do you believe in the use of punishment with children? Why or why not? It's going to be an interesting question, number two, because, of course, I strongly suspect that your responses will be dependent greatly upon whether or not you yourself have children. Just a guess. <laughs> Though the job of parents and teachers often involves the use of rewards and punishments to teach children right from wrong. Great. However, this assumes that the parents and or teachers know right from wrong or have a correct sense of right and wrong because all the, 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 the parents and the teachers are going to do is reward or punish behaviors that they choose to reward or punish. And hence, some behaviors will increase and some will decrease. Okay, Ideally, the child will... Oh, here, uh, to teach right from wrong. And in a perfect world, the child will eventually internalize this sense of right and wrong and call it morality, right? You reward the child. I mean, if anybody's ever looked at, um, um, uh, what's the guy's name? The moral development guy, Kohlberg. Lawrence Kohlberg's theory of moral development. You can see in stage one, it's all about rewards and punishments. But as you move along these stages, the child internalizes their sense of morality and extends it away from just a sense of um, of rewards and punishment. It's quite an interesting connection here. So anyway, ideally they would eventually internalize it. So now question, can this go bad? Can this go wrong? Because I'll tell you what, I had a friend of mine in high school. That boy had himself a kid real young and he was should not have been a daddy. I'll tell you that because he was rewarding his kids' behaviors, his kids' aggressive behaviors. His kid body slams a teddy bear and he rewards his son with social approval. And of course, the behavior of body slamming teddy bears goes way up. And, of course, it extends to other things, too, including other children at school. And very quickly, the teachers are like, this is just not right. And it all went back to parents are very effective at increasing or decreasing behavior through the addition of rewards and punishments. But who's to say that they set up the correct system of behaviors in the first place, right? The correct. Okay. So your opinion about that whole... Um, parenting or a punishment thing but i can tell you as a parent i have different opinions than some of you that are not been a parent all right so i'll see you the next time we'll come back and i think we're gonna do gestalt psychology